here we have single trial EEG data plotted from um, 12 randomly selected trials. The number on the uh, in the upper left of each plot indicates the trial number, um, and these all come from the same channel. So you can see there is quite a bit of uh, variability over different trials, but you can also see that there are some characteristics that appear to be similar over trials. So um, in particular, you can um, probably detect that there are some kind of uh, rhythmic or oscillatory uh, features that seem to be taking place in many or perhaps all of these trials. If we were to overlay all of these uh, trials, so there's 99 trials in this uh, data set, so if we were to overlay all 99 trials on top of each other, we would get this kind of grayish cloud uh, that you can see here. And if you would take at each time point, you would take the average over all the trials, over all 99 trials, so literally just sum the voltage potential from all trials and then divide by the number of trials. At each time point, you would get something uh, like this, and this is known as the event-related potential or the ERP. Here you can see the same exact ERP, but just on a more focused y-axis scaling. One of the first things that you will notice about the difference between the ERP and the single trial data is that they differ in amplitude by approximately one order of magnitude. This is sometimes interpreted to indicate that the single trial data are very noisy, um, and therefore we need to average over many trials in order to attenuate the noise um, but we will learn in uh, over the course of uh, many future videos that, um, in fact, many of these dynamics are, or many of these fluctuations, I should say, are information containing um, dynamics that, that give insights into the task at hand and, and how the task is uh, represented in, in the brain and processed by the brain. So in fact, EEG data and certainly single trial data are not nearly as noisy as your 30-year-old um, uh, intro psychology textbooks might imply. Okay, so here you see a, a different ERP from a, a different channel. So computing the ERP is very simple. We will see this in in MATLAB in a little bit, but it really is just taking the time domain average uh, at every time point over trials. Now, if you want to do ERP analyses, uh, you might want to focus on ERP components rather than on the, the time series vector itself. And here there are a few um, options for how to quantify the peaks in the ERP. And so, for example, you can <clears throat> quantify the peak-to-peak -peak distance, so the difference between, let's say, this peak and uh, the subsequent peak. Or you can measure the base-to-peak -peak distance, which is actually just the microvolt value here, assuming that the baseline period um, is, uh, is uh, normalized to zero. <clears throat> and when taking peaks, you can choose either to um, take the, the peak uh, point or a window around the peak, and of course then you have to decide how exactly to define a peak and how big to make the, the time window and so forth. These are uh, among the issues that you will need to um, consider and make decisions regarding if you are um, going to quantify ERP peaks. I'm not really going to say much more about this, uh, but there are several resources that you can look into if you are interested in um, quantifying the ERP peaks, including um, Steve Luck's uh, book on, um, on ERP. Um, you don't have to focus on peaks just because you are doing ERPs. You can also treat the ERP as a um, time varying uh, signal, and you can perform statistics at each time point, um, and then you would just have to correct for multiple comparisons over uh, because you are testing so many time points. Testing uh, these um, temporally autocorrelated time points um, and incorporating multiple comparisons correction is something that we will discuss uh, explicitly in a future video in the module on statistics. 
Okay. So, so this is the ERP just from uh, one single channel. Here you see the ERP plotted from all of the channels. So in this data set, we have 64 channels. So there are 64 lines being plotted um, on top of each other. And this is called a butterfly plot for reasons you can use your imagination to, uh, to try and understand. Butterfly plots are um, very useful for data inspection. They are yet another useful data inspection tool, in part because if you would see 64, 63 electrodes looking like this, and let's say you had one electrode that was doing something all the way down here, you would know immediately that something is wrong with this electrode. Maybe it's broken, maybe something went wrong in the importing or data processing. Um, and you can also use these butterfly plots to, um, to confirm and to understand when different features of the task were happening and how those are reflected um, in the timing of the activity that you measure at the scalp. This can also be um, uh, inspected by something called a topographical variance plot, which is really just the variance um, calculated at each time point of uh, across all of these electrodes. So not surprisingly, these peaks in here correspond to the peaks in this uh, plot. So this is very relevant. Here is the visual stimulus onset at time zero. And you can see that there was a large, um, large changes in the topography, um, uh, uh, many features in the, in the EEG topography at somewhere around 160 or 170 milliseconds. So that makes a lot of sense based on what happened at time zero. <clears throat> Okay, so now uh, we'll switch to um, MATLAB very quickly. Um, so you can see some code that will generate some of these figures. <clears throat> if you run this first cell here, we um, define a channel that we're going to use to plot. In this case, I chose FCZ, but you can change it to whatever other electrode. Here we define an X axis limit um, just for, uh, for um, fixing the plots. Here we define a number of trials to plot. So we are just, I just arbitrarily pick 12. You can also try changing this to some other number. Then this loop, you can run through it line by line and try and understand every piece of the code if you like. But it essentially just um, defines the layout of these multiple subplots, picks a random trial to plot, um, and then plots the data. So this is perhaps the most important line here. We are plotting the eeg.times, that's the vector of time points in milliseconds. Um, and here we are plotting the eeg.data from this channel, all time points, and this uh, random trial to plot. And it really is random, so you can try running this code over and over again, and you'll get different trials coming up uh, each time. All right, so now, in this cell, starting on line 40, we are going to compute the ERP and then uh, plot it. So you can see here we're going to plot the EEG.times vector by the ERP. And here on line 49 is where we will compute the ERP. So you can see that it's missing here. So um, I encourage you to um, pause the, the video or type very quickly and try and figure out how to um, create this ERP, how to um, finish this, uh, this piece of code. And remember that the ERP is simply the, the mean or the average of the EEG data from this electrode over um, all of the trials. Okay, so here's the solution. We want the EEG.data. We want the data from uh, this channel all time points, all trials. And now we want to take the average over the third dimension. It's the third dimension because uh, the trials are stored over the third dimension. Okay, so now you get this nice plot which reproduces the figure ad in the PowerPoint, except uh, this is uh, has a slightly nicer colors. So, the next figure is uh, nothing really that interesting. We are plotting the ERP again, this time without all the single trials. 
Um, I have this code here mainly in case you were interested in how to do some more um, slightly advanced um, plotting things like adding these lines and changing this from zero to stim uh, and so on. Okay. And now here we are going to create the butterfly plot and the topographical variance plot. You can see this um, just reproduces the figure I had in the PowerPoint. And here, so for the, the top plot, the, the butterfly plot, we are still computing the uh, mean of the EEG data. So this looks a lot like the code for the ERP. However, here we are not specifying which electrode to use. So that means we are using all the electrodes. So it's computing the ERP from all of the electrodes. Here for the topographical variance plot, this is the mean of all the electrodes. So it's exactly the same here. So this is the ERP. And now we are going to compute the variance over all of these electrodes. So this is just the definition of topographical variance. And you see the plot here. Okay. So there are several um, good motivations for um, focusing your data analyses on frequency-based and time-frequency-based uh, approaches, methods. One of those reasons is that um, a lot of information, a lot of relevant and valid, and potentially, potentially insightful information about the task processing and, and brain dynamics during, the, during cognition are lost during time domain averaging. And to illustrate this, I have here some simulated EEG data. You can see there's some ongoing activity, there's some high frequency uh, activity, and you can also see that in between time zero and somewhere around 400 or so, there is definitely some change. It's, it's visually recognizable that something is changing in the EEG data uh, or in the simulated data um, as a function of something that happened on uh, at time zero. However, uh, when we compute the ERP, you can see that the ERP, the time domain average, very quickly, even after only a few trials, goes to zero. And so this plot is showing the ERP from each trial uh, up until, or from, from the first trial up until um, each one of these trials. So after only six trials, the ERP is pretty much completely flat. But this may seem a little bit awkward because uh, your eyes are telling you that there is clearly something going on. And so what's going on here is that these are um, dynamics that are non-phase locked, we call this. And I will define this term non-phase locked and, and time locked um, in, a, uh, in a future video. But we can see that a very simple time frequency decomposition method here, just extracting alpha power, allows us to extract this component and quantify this feature of the data very easily with no loss of information um, after averaging all of the over all of these trials. Here you see another example. This is also simulated data. This might just look like noise when you uh, just first look at it. And after 100 trials, um, the time domain average, so the ERP very quickly goes to zero and we're left with just a little bit of noise. But you can see the time frequency representation extracts uh, the information content that is in these signals, although they are not readily uh, visually apparent. Um, and this is quite a um, kind of friendly looking um, um, set of features in the EEG data that's really just not present in the, in the ERP. It's lost in the time domain averaging. <clears throat> so you might be wondering um, why, it, why uh, do many um, people compute ERPs and focus on ERPs? And why um, is there traditionally this large focus on, on time domain analyses? I think there are several answers to this question. Um, and one of them really is just about the history of um, event-related potentials and, and technological and computational limitations that were present at the time that, um, that uh, people started um, computing ERPs and thinking about using ERPs to understand cognitive and, uh, and human brain functions. <clears throat> 
And so here, so this is a interesting little um, tidbit of uh, history of, of electrophysiology and cognitive electrophysiology. This machine here, this device, is the first signal averager for extracting event-related potentials from the EEG. It's from, uh, it was published in 1954, so this machine was probably um, developed and built in the, in the late 40s and early 50s. And here you see a wiring diagram for part of this um, machine. This is um, a screenshot of the figure, uh, figure uh, legend um, describing how the machine works. So the amplitude of the signal was recorded in each trial, each stimulus representation, at time points um, equidistant, and these amplitudes were added to capacitors, so physical capacitors. A fixed number of capacitors was used for an equivalent uh, number of time points. Um, and so this means that the sampling rate of the data was, was defined by the number of capacitors that you had built into this machine. It's quite remarkable. Now the first trial loaded the subsequent amplitudes, these are the EEG amplitudes, on each separate capacitor. In the next trial, the amplitudes of equivalent times relative to stem onset were added to the potentials of each of the capacitors. And so after a series of n trials, unsystematic shifts of signals leveled off to zero. And those systematically related to the stimulus, which are the um, event-related potentials, were kept and became visible. They could be read out of the capacitors and plotted on paper or sh or um, shown on an oscilloscope. So this is quite a um, remarkable feat of of creative uh, and and, and uh, uh, creative ingenuity and electrical engineering. But you can imagine that this was the technological capabilities that people had for for um, linking EEG dynamics to cognition and to human brain function in the in the 40s and the 50s and, and the 60s. And so at this time, uh, even something like a Fourier transform, a simple Fourier transform, was quite a challenge and uh, and and a lot of work to do. And so things like um, uh, even simple time frequency based analyses that nowadays are are becoming very commonplace and and can really be done by your phone uh, were were really just unimaginably time consuming seventy years ago. And so I think this is a large part of the reason why uh, the uh, development of the history of cognitive electrophysiology had such a strong focus on event-related potentials. Of course, fortunately, we are not limited by these kinds of um, uh, uh, technological capabilities anymore because now we have uh, digital computers that are very fast and very impressive. Anyway, I hope that you enjoyed this little um, historical a uh, tidbit of uh, of uh, the development of of cognitive electrophysiology.